And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. every one of us is absolutely honest, there are some things, some situations we just avoid. You've got yours, I've got mine, everyone's a little bit different. Uh, if, if you deal with allergies, you know there's certain things that you avoid. As a matter of fact, a very good friend of mine uh, has a, a, a passion for Mexican food, a lot like mine. He loves Mexican food. And so, but if he were to sit down at a table and somebody brought him this dish right here, they brought that, it looks beautiful, fresh, delicious. He would not eat it. And here's why. It could kill him. He's actually allergic to mangoes. Some of you are allergic to shellfish. But when you're allergic to something, you avoid it. You stay away from it. I, I found as a, as a young man, we did a lot of backpacking. And uh, we would backpack in the Sierra Nevadas, places where there were bears. And so every night, we would take all of our food, tie it up, in a bag, throw a rope over the branch of a tree, a high one, pull it up in the air, not all the way to the tree, floating in midair there, because we were trying to avoid bears. Because bears, though they, they might look cute and cuddly, uh, they're not. They're ferocious and dangerous. We avoid them. So we all have things we avoid. Now, as in my years being a pastor, I've discovered that there are certain things that people just kind of avoid, that they don't like to think about or talk about. And not everybody, but, but a lot of people. Uh, here's one of those things. Blood. People, some people get squeamish when they think about blood, if they see blood. Uh, some people don't want to talk about blood. It just it makes them, Some of you right now are going, uh, I don't know if I want to hear this, but that, that's something that people avoid. Another thing is death. A lot of people don't want to talk about death, don't want to think about death. The whole concept of death just kind of creeps them out. I remember growing up, I grew up in Orange County in Southern California, and there were not cemeteries Anywhere in our neighborhoods, they were off somewhere kind of out of the way with a big wall around them. It was a place you would go to for, an, for a sad occasion. But, but when I moved to the Midwest, in West Michigan, there were cemeteries in the middle of neighborhoods. I mean, there were literally homes. I remember the first time I saw a house next to a cemetery, I thought, ooh, that just seems strange because I hadn't been exposed to the, just the realities of death, that death is part of life. I remember as a young pastor, the first time I got a call a family had lost a child. The child had had a long battle with cancer and had passed away. And they called and asked if I could come over and visit the, the family. So I went right over to their home, and when I walked in, the body of this young boy was still there on the couch. And we visited for, it was like two, three, four hours. Family came, friends came. They didn't call to have the body removed till later that evening because they weren't they weren't creeped out about death. They realized that, that Stephen had died, that he loved Jesus, he was with Jesus. But they, they had a different view. Of it. For a lot of people, death is one of those things that they say, I don't want to talk about it. I want to avoid that. Sacrifice. If you read in the Bible, the Old Testament, the, the, the sacrificial system, then it creeps some people out. They don't want to talk about it. Judgment. Another theme that, that goes all the way through the Bible, that God who was holy, 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 is ultimately the judge. Well, judgment, people avoid that topic. Well, what I need to let you know is, is that today in week three of this series of Hebrews, because we're reading this book, the Bible, because we're digging into Hebrews, and it looks back to the Old Testament, who Christ is, and where God's taking us, I'm going to be including four of those six things that people avoid in one sermon. Don't log off. Don't turn off your TV. Don't stop listening or watching. I believe that we need to hear and sometimes look at things that are challenging. But in today's sermon, we're going to talk about blood, death, sacrifice, and judgment. All of those in one sermon. Why? Because today we're going to get a vision of Jesus Christ, 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And if you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, you can write in your mind, go through Jesus Christ, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blood, death, sacrifice, and our judgment for sin taken away. You see, in the good news of Jesus, these things we avoid that are scary for us become things that we can look at and understand because Jesus is the one who sets us free from all the things that that terrorize us, that create fear and anxiety and worry. But we have to look at these things and look at Jesus. So my prayer is that today we will get a fresh vision of Jesus. And maybe you've missed some of this vision because you've averted your eyes and you haven't wanted to see some of these tougher topics. But open your eyes and your mind and your heart today. And you will get a fresh vision of Jesus Christ who loves you, who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's good news. So let's look together at the book of Hebrews and we're gonna look at three different realities that kind of come with understanding and seeing a vision of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Here's the first one. Jesus, the Lamb of God, died as our ransom. He died as a ransom to pay the price for you and for me. He gave his life willingly for us. And we need to look and have this vision of Jesus as the one who ransomed himself to buy us, to pay pay the price that we we deserve for our sins and to wash that away. Turn in your Bibles and your Bible app to Hebrews chapter 9. And I want to read verse 15 and then we'll jump to verse 22. I encourage you in your own time to study the whole passage, but we're going to look at a couple verses within this portion of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. He has died as a ransom. He paid the price. You've seen movies and TV shows where someone gets a ransom note. Someone's been kidnapped. Somebody's been taken. And the only way to get them back is for somebody to pay the price, to pay the ransom. There's always the, the, the drama of will they pay the price or won't they? Are they willing to or won't they? And it creates drama. But God looks and says there was a ransom. There was a price for you and for me and for our sins. And Jesus paid the price in our place. And then look at verse 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This shows us what the price was, what the ransom was that Jesus paid. It wasn't bags of silver and gold. It wasn't power and possessions. What he paid to ransom us was his own life. He, Jesus, who knew no sin, he became sin so that he could give to us that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus paid the price. He is our ransom. So a question for you. How would you respond if someone gave their life for yours and died in your place? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. But imagine in this life, in our world, if somebody saw that that you were going to die and they laid their life down to pay the price so that you wouldn't have to. Man, you would have a whole different perspective on the world and on that person. There's a movie that came out years ago, a World War II movie uh, called Saving Private Ryan. And maybe you saw this movie or maybe you didn't see this movie because there were too many of those things that people avoid in it. There was too much blood, too much death. So some people go, I can't stomach that, I can't watch it. It's it's a hard movie to watch. But the storyline has a very powerful redemptive message to it. And the storyline is basically that this captain, Captain John Miller, he is sent with a handful of soldiers on a very specific mission to go and to get one soldier, Private Ryan, take him out of the battle, out of the war, wherever he is, and they don't don't really quite know where he is. A lot of things have kind of gotten mixed up there. And and they're sent to get him and bring him home. Why? Because his mother had received in, in one day, not one, not two, but three notices that three of her sons had died in war. And they were trying to get the one son left out of there and back home. And, and, and so this Captain John Miller goes with a small group and they go to rescue him, to get him, and to bring him out. And if you haven't seen the movie yet and you don't want a spoiler, then plug your ears for about 20 seconds. But what happens is near the end of the movie, 
when this captain who's gone to rescue him and bring him out has got him and he knows he's going to be able to go home, he's been injured, he's dying. And he whispers something in the ear of Private Ryan. And at the end of the movie, Private Ryan has grown to be an elderly man. He goes with his, with his family to the cemetery where, where Captain John Miller's cross is there in the ground. And, and he's basically responding to what this captain had said to him all those years before. What did he whisper in his ear before he died? He simply said this. He said, earn this. Earn this. All these soldiers died to set you free. Now you earn this. Now here's where the comparison breaks down. Jesus doesn't look at you and me and say, earn this, because we can't. He says, receive this. On the cross, when Jesus is dying, he says, receive this, accept this. I'm giving you everything you need. I'm dying as a ransom in your place for your sins. And Jesus cries out, not saying earn this, because we couldn't earn what he gave. All we can do is receive it. So Jesus said, just receive this. Believe in me, accept the gift. That's the heart of Jesus. He's paid the price. He's ransomed us through his death. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, the Lamb of God, a second thing, is the one-time, perfect, final sacrifice for our sins. I mean, there's a lot in that one sentence. Just listen to these words. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the one-time, perfect, final sacrifice sacrifice for all of our sins. There is a sense of absolute completion at the cross of Jesus Christ. When Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, gave his life. When Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, it's paid, it's done, he meant it. Listen to these words from Hebrews chapter 9. We'll begin in verse 23, and we'll read through verse 28. I'd encourage you with this passage as well to maybe later today, go back and look at this and read it and reflect, and there's so much here. I want us to get the big picture, but you can dig in and get greater detail by meditating on this scripture. But Hebrews 9, 23 says this. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. It's pointing to the tabernacle and it's pointing to the temple and the ancient people of God. When they were, when they were setting these things up, they would sprinkle blood on these things to sort of cleanse them. So, so they were to purify them so they could be used in the service of God. It says, to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And again, there's that better. The, the, the sacrifice of Jesus is better than all the, the earthly sacrifices of animals. Verse 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. Jesus didn't come into the tabernacle or into the temple. The, these are things that were, that were made by human hands. They were a copy of the true one. But he entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. He appeared for us. He became our ransom. He became our payment. He died in our place, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest entered the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. It's going back again, if you know the Old Testament way of doing things, that the high priest once a year would go uh, in, in, into the tabernacle or into the temple, would go into the, into the most holy place, and once a year would give a sacrifice for himself and for the people. But it was every year, year after year, year after year, year after year. And so it says he didn't he'd go to, to offer himself again and again the way the high priest did, but verse 26, otherwise, if that was the case, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus, Jesus didn't have to come year after year or day after day. He offered himself once. And then verse 27, just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin. That's taken care of. That's done. That's finished. He will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Jesus Christ has paid the price. He is the perfect 
final sacrifice for sins. So again, let's just pause and, and reflect in our own hearts to this question. If Christ's sacrifice for us is, is final and complete, why do we keep trying to add to it? What is it in us that makes us think and feel like we have to keep measuring up and adding to what Jesus did? I, I gotta read my Bible so much every day. I gotta put so much in the offering plate. I gotta do all these different things and then, then I'll feel like, okay, then I've, I'm worthy of God's salvation. Well, you know, we, we read the Bible because we wanna know God's truth. We give because God's been good to us and we wanna give with joy. We don't do these things to earn our way to God. We do these things because he has been so good, because he's the final sacrifice. He paid the price. He let himself be ransomed for us. We want to live for him. And so just be encouraged to be, to be very, very careful that you, you aren't trying to earn God's salvation, but responding to his gift of salvation. And I hope and pray for you that you have come to Jesus, you've received him. If you haven't yet, if you've never yet said yes to Jesus, I want you to know that before the service is over, you will have an opportunity to receive the ransom gift of Jesus, his final one-time sacrifice for you. And when, I, when he died on the cross, you were in his heart, you were in his mind, he knew your name. He was dying for you. Before this, this morning is done, if you want to, you can receive that gift of his grace and walk in his joy. So the third thing we learn about Jesus, the Lamb of God, when we read the book of Hebrews is that we learn that Jesus, the Lamb of God, makes us perfect in the sight of the Father. This is, this is hard to swallow and almost impossible to believe. To imagine that you, that I, that any human being could be seen as perfect and cleansed in the sight of God Almighty, who is holy, holy, holy. But that's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus, the Lamb of God, when he takes away your sins and my sins, when he died on the cross as our ransom in our place, as the final sacrifice, when he said, it's finished, he didn't just mean the work of salvation, he meant the price for our sins. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are washed clean. And God Almighty, the holy God of the universe, looks at you and me through Jesus Christ, through his shed blood, through his sacrifice. This is why we can't look away from those things, even though they're tough. We get a vision of Jesus and we realize we're seen as cleansed, not because we're so good, but because he's so good and he's paid the price. That's good news. That is glorious. That will change your life now for all this, the days in this world and for eternity if you embrace this Jesus. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to begin reading in, uh, in verse 1 of Hebrews 10. And we'll read through verse 4, then we'll jump down to verse 10. So just have your Bible open or your app open to Hebrews chapter 10. And just try to follow this, the journey of learning that goes on here and the message that's being shared. And, and there's a lot that refers back to the old way of things and the old sacrificial system, but just listen to these words and let God speak to your heart. Hebrews 10, 1. The law, the Old Testament way of doing things, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. The, the new things outweigh it, but it was important, it still is important, but it's a shadow compared to the new things. Not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly, year after year, it can never make perfect those who draw near to worship. All the old sacrificial system, which was important, but isn't the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus is, it says it can't make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, they would, would they not have stopped being offered? If they could get the job done, they'd have stopped. They kept bringing them day after day, year after year, because it didn't satisfy. It didn't fulfill. Only Christ could do that. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. They reminded the people of the reality of sins and the need for a Savior, a coming Messiah. They were awaiting Jesus who has come. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Whatever they offered back then, it would remind them of the depth of their sin, but it wouldn't wash their sins away. Now go to verse 10. And by that will, we have been made holy we, you and I, have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We are made holy. We are cleansed. Pure in God's sight. Not by any works of our own, but by the work of Jesus Christ when we receive it by grace through faith. And then verse 11. 
Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered for all time the one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It's finished. It's done. He sat down. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That's Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Now, it's interesting when you read this passage, you realize that if you ask the question, well, who's the great high priest? And the answer is Jesus. And you ask the question, well, who's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? The answer is Jesus. I heard a story years ago about a a little kid in a Sunday school class, and the teacher was just doing a lesson with the kids, and the teacher said, kids, kids, I'm thinking of something right now. I'm thinking of something. It's a little creature, and it scurries around. It can climb a tree really well. It has a big, fluffy tail. It has whiskers. It collects, it collects nuts. Anybody know what I'm thinking of? And one of the, kind of the brighter kids kind of raises their hand and says, you know, teacher, it sounds a lot like a squirrel, but I'm going to say the answer is Jesus because the answer to almost everything in Sunday school is Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is through the Bible again and again. In this rich theological passage, it says there is a great high priest who, who, is, who is offering the sacrifice. And there is a lamb of God who's being offered as a sacrifice. Who's the high priest? Jesus. Who's the sacrifice? Jesus. Because it's all about Jesus. So we recognize that Jesus Christ is the one who laid his life down, who paid the price. So a question, again, just pause and reflect. Do you understand that God sees you as holy, perfect, forgiven, and loved. That when God, do you understand that when God looks at you, if you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, if you've named him as your savior and you confessed your sins and you let him wash you clean, he makes you holy, perfect, forgiven, and loved. That's who you are. That's who I am. Not in our own power, in the power of Jesus Christ. That should stagger us and amaze us over and over and over again. And maybe, maybe you say, I don't know that to be true. I've, I've never really understood that it's not about how good I am or how hard I work. I've always kind of thought I've got to earn my way. Maybe you have a church background or a home that you were taught. You earn everything. And if you don't earn it, you don't get it. And maybe for the first time today, you're recognizing, you mean I can, I mean, I can come to God, God Almighty who's perfect, just as I am with all my wrongs and sins, all my mess ups, everything I've done, I can come just as I am. And he loves me already. He loved me at my worst. And I can come to him and say, I I confess all my wrongs. I give them to you. I accept Jesus, this Lamb of God. I accept the the payment of Jesus on the cross and his death for me, that he's my ransom. I I can just receive Jesus and he will wash me clean and give me new life and call me a loved one of God. Are you saying that that that's for me? And I'm here to tell you today, yes, that is what God offers to you. I don't offer it. Shoreline Church doesn't offer it. We can't. God offers that because Jesus Christ is your ransom. He's the final payment. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so if right now, if you want to come before God and give him your wrongs and give him your sins, and receive his love and his grace and the person of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness and then take his hand and say, oh God, now as I take the hand of Jesus, I will follow you all the days of my life and forevermore. God is waiting for you to do that. And and once you do, he's not gonna say to you, earn this, because you can't. He's gonna say, I delight that you've received the gift that I'm offering. So if you've never received Jesus, I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. The sermon's not over yet, but I want to just pause right now in the middle of the message, and I want to pray to Jesus. And if you are a follower of Jesus, will you pray right now for those people in homes and places all around our community and all around the world who right now are maybe saying, I'm ready to receive Jesus. If you understand now what Jesus has done and you're ready to receive him, will you pray with me? 
Dear God, I pray right now for those people scattered around our community, around our nation, maybe around the world, that are hearing for the first time this good news of Jesus in a way that makes sense to them, that they can receive it. And I pray, oh God, you will hear their heart right now when they pray to you. And will you, wherever you are right now, will you in your heart with absolute clarity, if you want to say it out loud, you can. If you want to say it in your heart and your mind, you can. God will hear you either way. Will you just say right now, will you say, dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Lamb of God. Jesus, take away my sins. Take away all my wrongs. My thoughts, my words, my actions that have been wrong, wash them away, Jesus. I give them all to you. I thank you, Jesus, for loving me before I loved you. I thank you for being my ransom and paying the price for all my wrongs. I thank you that, Jesus, your sacrifice is so powerful that it washes away all of my sins. And Jesus, this day, I accept you as the forgiver of all my wrongs. And I take your hand as the leader of my life. Jesus, help me follow you all the days of my life and into eternity for your glory. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I want you to know that the Bible says that when one person receives the forgiveness of Jesus, heaven has a party. The angels of heaven rejoice. There's rejoicing right now in heaven if you prayed that prayer from your heart and if you meant it. And if you did, I'm going to share with you in a few minutes a next step you can take because we want to help you start growing in that new faith in Jesus Christ. But for all those who are listening, those who have just come to know Jesus or maybe you've walked with Jesus for a short time or a long time, when we understand he's the Lamb of God, it changes everything in us. And so each week in this series, we just pause to think about how does the work of Jesus, the person of Jesus, this fresh vision of Jesus, how does it change my life and who I am? And so here's some transformation that can happen. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God, we draw near and worship because he has opened the way to the most holy place with his own life. When you know that he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, you know that he's, he's just thrown open the doors of heaven, of glory, of all your heart longs for. And you can walk into the presence of God Almighty, not because you've earned it, because he's paid the price for you and you've received it. So when you worship, Come with anticipation. Come with joy. Whether it's corporately like this where we're worshiping together in different locations but at the same time, whether it's just driving in your car or taking a walk through your neighborhood alone and you sing songs of praise or your heart's being lifted up to God, do it with passion because Jesus has opened the way to come right into the presence of God. And then next, because Jesus is the Lamb of God, we humbly surrender and turn from sin because he gave everything for us. When you follow Jesus, whether you're a brand new Christian or a longtime Christian, the enemy will entice you and tempt you with all kinds of things. And you just keep saying, no, 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 that's not who I am because I've taken the hand of Jesus and I follow his ways. And I tell you, the enemy will keep throwing little lures out there and little bait trying to invite you in. But you hold close to Jesus, you stay in his word and you follow him. And when you stumble and fall, you get back up He picks you up, he dusts you off, and he says, okay, my son, okay, my daughter, let's keep walking. Keep following me. And and so so you surrender your sin to him, and you follow him in his ways. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God, we joyfully follow in his footsteps. And now listen to this, this is important. Because he worked for us, is working on our behalf, and his work lasts forever. Forever. Jesus worked for us. He died on the cross. He paid the price. He left heaven. He worked for us. He's working for us right now. The Bible says he intercedes for you right now. When you pray, he brings your prayers to the Father. He's there for you. And then forevermore, he's preparing a place for us to be with him for eternity. An eternity beyond our description, joys and passion and excitement and beauty that we can't even comprehend. Jesus is preparing that all for us right now. And and, and so we follow him each moment of each day. And then, because Jesus is the Lamb of God, we witness more intentionally 
because his sacrifice is enough for everyone. If you believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, then you know that his forgiveness is available to anybody and everybody who asks him. And our call is not to save anybody. We can't. We're broken. We're sinful. Our call is to introduce people to Jesus who wants to change their lives. And so right now at Shoreline Church, with a lot of things happening in our world, with a lot of things kind of closed down, a lot of our outreach ministries that we normally do, and even as we move towards Christmas time, some things we do, we might have to do them differently because of COVID and because of social distancing. But one thing that we can do is we can still be good neighbors. You can still be the good neighbor. I want to challenge you to go to the Shoreline website and click on the link that says The Good Neighbor. And when you go there, I really want to challenge you to do this in the next 24 hours. When you click on that link, you're going to see six steps that are so simple and so intuitive and so easy, you're going to say, I could do that. Matter of fact, this morning, I clicked on every one of those steps on the website, and I watched the video for every one of those steps, because the videos are only 60 seconds to 120 seconds. And so I got a fresh reminder of what it means to be a good neighbor. I'm trying to live into this. I hope you do also. So here's these simple steps. You ask, who is my neighbor? The first step is figure out who your neighbors are. You might not know who your neighbors are. So figure out who your neighbors are. That's your first step. Here's the second step. Meet your neighbors. Just say hi, wave. Go by and bring some, you know, bring some, uh, we've been giving out fresh boxes of vegetables here at the church. And I picked up seven or eight of them and Sherry and I brought them to our neighbors. And, we, and we, they were all neighbors we knew, but we, we were reconnecting with them. But meet your neighbors. Then here's the third step. It's really challenging. Do something nice. Acts of kindness. Bring a gift. Say a kind word. This is all part of just shining the light of Jesus. So who are my neighbors? Meet my neighbors. Acts of kindness. Then make a connection. Find some way to, to text, to call, to chat, but find a way to make a connection. There's more detail on the website. Then number five, have a spiritual conversation. And that doesn't mean you walk in the door and say, tell me about what you believe about Jesus. But you can ask somebody, oh, what, what, how were you raised in terms of beliefs? And listen to their story. We actually have a list on the website, I'm not kidding, of over 300 questions to open conversations. And over, I think, over 45 questions that open the door for a spiritual conversation. If you look at that list on the website, you'll find four or five questions that you're like, why did I never think to ask somebody that question? And it'll open the door for those spiritual conversations. But remember, that's step five. Walk your way through this. And then step six is just say, what's my next step? What am I going to do next? I want to challenge you. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, if you believe His grace is big enough for your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers, will you take time to walk through these six steps prayerfully and invite God to lead you? And I think through that, God will shine His light and His love into the lives of people that have really never heard about how great Jesus is. Before I close in prayer, I want to invite you, if you today prayed for the first time, that you, would, that you would take the next step, the next courageous step, and let us connect with you. I'll tell you how to do that in just a moment, but let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Thank you that, Jesus, you left the glory of heaven to come in this world for us, to die in our place for our sins, to be our ransom, to pay the price completely. We thank you. We give you praise. May we walk in the, in the joy of that reality, May we not try to earn your love because you've given it freely. And may we share your love with our neighbors, with our family, with our friends at school, our co-workers in the workplace, wherever we go. May we shine the light of Jesus. We pray this in his name and for his glory. Amen. Well, before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give a couple of invitations. The first is this. If you prayed to receive Jesus Christ today, Will you text the word faith, F-A-I-T-H? You put your faith in Jesus. Just text the word faith to the number you see on the screen. And we will follow up with you and help you take steps to grow, to take the hand of Jesus and walk with him. If you've made that commitment, the next best thing you can do that'll change your life is to text the word faith to that number. And we will personally contact you and say, how can we help you take your next steps? That would give us an incredible privilege and honor to walk alongside of you. So we encourage you to do that. If you need prayer for anything, for a joy or a need, there's a number on the screen. You can call that number or you can email and we will pray with you and we will pray for you. If you're new to Shoreline today, 
Will you text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen? We want to give you a warm, personal welcome to Shoreline Church. So if you text the, the word welcome, we'll follow up with you also. If you have questions about anything in the life of the church, about what we believe, will you email the address you see on the screen, and we will follow up and, and try to help you find good answers to your questions. You know what? God's not afraid of your questions. We're not afraid of your questions. We'd love to hear what's on your mind. So you can send us any questions you have about the church or about belief, and we'd like to interact with you. And then finally, this Wednesday, in just a couple days, it's one of my favorite Wednesdays of the month, and that is Night of Worship. We will gather at 6.15 for worship. Uh, the worship team and I will be here, socially distanced, leading you. It'll be an online streaming service. It'll be live. And will you be sure that you have some bread and some juice or some wine? You're ready to have communion because we're going to share communion together. And as we've been doing through the whole year, we're looking at two characters. We're going to look at, at the Apostle Peter and also William Wilberforce, one of the most fascinating Christians, I think, in the history of the church. You will be compelled by the life of Peter and the life of William Wilberforce. So I invite you to join us at 615, wherever you are, online, and let's worship together for a night of worship. Now as we close our time, may you walk in the presence, in the love of in the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. He has had mercy on us. And will you shine his light everywhere you go. God bless you. Have a great week. And if you responded in any of those ways, we'll get back to you as quick as we can. Have a great week.